In this video, I'm gonna show you why React is the framework to learn in 2020 and give you an overview of the most important parts. Here's learn React in just five minutes. React is on top right now, and it's not just my opinion. Using five years of data from Google Trends, you can see Angular used to be on top, but that was a few years ago. Back in 2016, React passed it, and it's been growing ever since, until the current day where React is about twice as popular. On the Stack Overflow survey, React and Angular are pretty much tied for most used with Vue a little bit down the list. It's a different story when we switch to the loved frameworks. React is number one up there with Vue. The thing we should care about most though is how many jobs there are. According to Indeed, Angular has 546 jobs available now, while React has close to 2,000, around 2.6 times more. Okay, here's enough to get you up and running and coding with React. If you don't already understand HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to a basic level, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot, so go learn those. To get up and running, you need to install three modules from NPM. Unfortunately, doing this way requires a lot of config, so there's a better way. The React team at Facebook itself released a library called Create React App, which helps you get up and running really, really fast. And boom, you're ready to go. You'll have a file index.js, which uses ES6 imports, that is importing a library name into a variable on which you can access all the methods that library has to offer. Moving down the page, we have the app component. This stores all our subcomponents and all our React and returns JSX, which we'll talk about in a minute. Finally, the React DOM render function. Here's how this works. Just think of it as taking our HTML file, finding element ID root, and replacing it with everything that's inside app. Let's talk about the component, the atomic unit of React. The official definition is a loosely coupled unit, but I think a better definition is a building block, which contains both markup and JavaScript logic. Components can also contain other components and will always roll up to the app component. And finally, they must return JSX. This has an HTML-like syntax, which can get flipped to writing JavaScript when you put brackets in. Keep in mind it's not HTML. There are big and small differences. Class gets converted to class name and you can enter an on-click listener with a property on click. Since JSX is in real JavaScript, that's why we need that library webpack. It converts our React components into a single file called bundle.js that the browser can actually run. Okay, here's a component called book that we might actually write. We always have to export our component from its file. The first argument is always props, which allows us to receive data from components above. We activate JS with a curly bracket so we can render title on the page. In a second parent component, we use that child component book twice. Notice how we import it and then pass in title as a prop. In our child component, props.title gets replaced with what we passed in. Using object destructuring like so is also common to pull props out from the argument. Let's make our parent component books.js a little bit more like a real life component. Usually we're gonna have some JSON or in this case, an array of books that we wanna render on the page. We'll have to use the JavaScript array method map to do this, and we can return a component for each item in the array. This is a pattern you'll see a lot in React. Let's talk about state, a dynamic form of storage that lives inside of our components. The 2020 way to create state is with a useState hook, which will return a value and a setter function. This is returned an array of size two, so we destructure them into individual variables. State is dynamic storage because every time a state variable changes, our component gets flagged for a potential re-render. This is where the magic of React comes in. React holds a separate DOM representation called the virtual DOM, and then it compares it against the real DOM with a reconciliation algorithm to efficiently determine whether the page has to be updated or not. And efficient updates mean your page runs faster. Let's do another example with state and some other things we haven't seen before. First, we initialize a hook to false. Then we use that hook to determine whether we show a book or not with an and conditional. We pass our setter function as a callback to on click. So when we click that button, show book will be set to true. Let's talk about lifecycle effects. These are just functions triggered when a component's created, updated, or removed from the page. Conveniently, these are all managed with the use effect hook. The first argument is a function that runs when your component is created on the page. When and if it runs again depends on the second argument, which is an array of triggers. The simplest way to think about it is when one of these triggers changes value, then the function will run again. For example, here, if showbook changes to true. Finally, we can return a function inside this function, which will get run when our component unmounts. So what about when your application gets really big, you're passing state five components deep? In that case, you'd want to use application state. You can either use Redux or React context to achieve this. If you want to use context, all you have to do is create one, wrap your application in a provider, and access it with the use context hook. 
Don't overthink it. It's just an object you can put anything in. That's React in five minutes. Please like the video so people can find it and subscribe for more five minute videos. It's what Keanu would want.